Hey, Laura. Okay, let me invite everybody. If folks can start sending me requests. Awesome, we're starting to get requests. I see folks from GGJ, Shah, Julia. You guys wanna start saying what's up to our audience? I'm gonna hey. try to get Leona um, on here next. Yes, hello. Hey, Ramon. <laughs> Hey, Soma. Oh, good luck with the canoe ride. Have a mm -hmm. wonderful time there. I wish I was there too. I want to go on a canoe. I know, that sounds fun. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing Leona just yet, um, but for folks who um, are just joining as viewers, if you can just put your name, pronouns, uh, where you're watching from, which territories, um, and I think we'll, um, I'll take a look out for um, Leona, uh, but if... Um, if I can, I'm going to just start the live by introducing myself and the Hoodwink Collective. Um, so my name is Alejandria Lyons, the Coalition Coordinator for New Mexico No Fall Solutions, hopping on the Hoodwink um, in the Hot House IG today. Um, today, you know, this is, um, we're trying to, one, celebrate Earth Week, but each day, day, Earth Week, every day, um, and we're here with a bunch of uh, activists, organizers, individual um, water and land protectors that are working um, against false solutions um, and decolonial um, organizing from youth and indigenous perspectives. Um, so just real quick, the Hoodwin Collaborative is a coalition of climate justice organizations, activists dedicated to producing popular education, organizing resistance against false solutions to the climate crisis. Um, in 2021, the collaborative published the groundbreaking um, educational zine, also known as Hoodwinked in the Hot House. It's the same name as the Instagram handle. Um, third edition, re um, Resist False Solutions to Climate Change, presenting a stunning illustrated compendium of the false corporate promises that continue the hoodwink elected officials, the public uh, protecting systems of extractivism and colonialism while deferring the real solutions um, needed for climate change, taking perspectives from folks like we have today, really. Um, so over the last two years, the collaborative has printed um, over uh, 47,000 copies of Hoodwinked in five different languages to distribute among grassroots groups, um, as well as the UNFCCC uh, Conference of Party Spaces, um, produced an audiobook, has hosted several widely known webinars, um, widely attended. Um, so these efforts continue to widen the opposition to harmful corporate climate schemes around the world to find um, more information or to listen to Hoodwing or read it in whatever language, um, please visit climatefalsesolutions.org. So um, I think I saw Leona on. That's just a quick bit about Hoodwing. So thank you all for joining from um, all of your accounts. Um, 
I'm going to pass it to Shaw to just briefly uh, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Shaw Mride Ongalung. I am Micronesian, Palawan. Um, I currently work as a director of digital strategy at Digital Climate Coalition, as well as being the executive director at Pacifica Uprising. And I, the work I do um, is education, inform, uh, education, information dissemination, um, getting the word out about where climate justice, bodily autonomy, and decolonial futures all intersect. And that's often through media, what animations, podcasts, short form videos, um, and also showing up at direct actions because solidarity is not an esoteric or sort of abstract theoretical concept. Uh, solidarity is just us caring about one another. And it's one way for us to honor our ancestors is to show up in solidarity for our fellow indigenous people. and I will popcorn it over to whoever wants to go next. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Leona. Hey, so, so sorry, I'm, I'm late. I'm new to Instagram. I'm like an old lady here um, because this is only my second time using Instagram Live and I'm really happy to be invited um, to talk about nuclear stuff. So I'm in New Mexico. Um, uh, just for my relatives, my Dine relatives, I'll say my clans real quickly. Um, yeah, so you're apartment now. And uh, we're in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on um, Julia's people's land. And um, I'm Dine, so my people are a couple hours to the west, and um, I've been working a lot on uranium mining issues, and now there's a lot of push for new nuclear because of um, this idea, this false solution that it's going to help with the climate crisis, and we can talk more about that later. So thanks, Ikehab. Yeah, thank you. Um... Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good to see folks joining the live feed. Um, my name is Julia Bernal. I am from Sandia Pueblo, um, Tiwa speaking people um, here in the middle Rio Grande of New Mexico. I'm the executive director for Pueblo Action Alliance, and we are a Pueblo uh, women, femme, a uh, two-spirit-led organization um, here throughout the state of so-called New Mexico. Um, we work a lot with our public communities on uh, climate justice, environmental justice, economic and social justice um, issues that directly impacts our communities and our homelands and our ancestral, um, our ancestral sites and sacred places. Um, we are um, also really involved in youth, uh, youth action work and, um, you know, just like being a vehicle for our community members to access um, uh, information uh, about things relating to um, environmental or natural resource planning, um, any sort of environmental justice issues that have to pertain to extractivism or other false climate solutions. And so we've been doing this work um, for over six years now as, a, as an organization, an operating organization, and um, are just really happy to be collaborators with Hoodwinked and the Hot House. And um, of course, with all of the other organizers that are on this call, um, I feel like just to echo what Shaw was saying around uh, these I ideals of global solidarity, um, having an internationalist analysis on climate initiatives and climate solutions is like really important to our work. Um, and it, it definitely is a mechanism to help us build a lot more um, 
unified stances against uh, global capitalism and other ways in which um, you know the the one percent continue to um, extract our resources and exploit our people. So really happy to be here with you all today. I'll pass it back to Ale. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Um, now I'm going to invite um, our last speaker, Jonathan, um, from Youth United for Climate Crisis Action to join. Um, I might have to ask either Julia or Shaw if one folks, one of y'all can. Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'm not sure how to leave. I got it. <laughs> I guess I just... Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, awesome and really happy to join all of you. Uh, like Ali just said, my name is Jonathan Juarez Alonso. I'm 20 years old and I'm from the Pueblos of Laguna and Asleta. I currently serve as the policy lead for Youth United for Climate Crisis Action. So Yucca is a youth-led organization. We were founded in 2019 and we um, were founded around, you know, just demands of our, our elected officials to, you know, keep fossil fuels in the ground and rapidly transition our economy to 100% renewables. And since 2019, we've been continuing that fight through various campaigns. Uh, I think one of the most recent has been, you know, our anti-hydrogen campaign. Um, but yeah, we have uh, hundreds of members throughout northern and central New Mexico. Um, and it's been really awesome to join this team. I joined in 2021. Um, but really awesome to join and, and build partnership, you know, really across the state. I think that's something that we've been able to do uh, that has just kind of congealed so beautifully and just come together in such a powerful way as young people, you know, from all sorts of communities, uh, Pueblo and Diné communities as well. Um, it's just been, you know, awesome to be a part of it and awesome to join you all this evening and excited to, to share the space. Um, but yeah, I think I'm the last one and I, I'll go ahead and uh, hop off uh, so that uh, our other panelists can join back. I'm w I'm willing to hop off if I can figure it out. But um, while while um, our other guest is rejoining, I just want to share the book. I got some in the mail, so I'll be referring to that. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Leanna, for showing that cover. Um, yeah, I'm so excited to, to know and, and work with all of you through No False Solutions and um, here. I'm also located in uh, Southern Tua Territory, um, also so-called Albuquerque. Um, and yeah, I mean, we've been doing a lot of work specifically around hydrogen and carbon sequestration, but also, you know, hearing stories from across the state and regionally about the different false solutions. So, um, you know, I think we'll start off with Leona, but can you talk about, you know, some of um, your fighting against false solutions and, you know, the way you're supporting what you see um, as real solutions while centering specifically um, you know, decolonial ways of thinking, youth and climate organizing. Um, yeah, in your in your vision. So, so a bit about what work you're doing and how you do it. Sure. Um, so, I want to just um, maybe give a little a, a background uh, for folks that don't know me, um, because <clears throat> I want to highlight um, the Kiva Club. I want to give a shout out to. Uh, student organization I used to be a part of um, like 20 years ago. Um, so I'm really dating myself here. This was when I was an undergrad at UNM. Um, and so the Kiva Club did a lot of really excellent work. Um, and, and that's how I was introduced to EJ and all of this stuff. So I don't want to put down student organizing. I think it's really important. Um, but uh, I right now, uh, fast forwarding, I've been work, I worked with many organizations. So like the first group I spent a lot of time with uh, is the Sage Council, uh, which doesn't exist anymore. So they were working on sacred sites protection um, and uh, then Eastern Navajo Diné against uranium mining, which was fighting a, a uranium mine. Um, they still are, 
uh, fighting that mine. Um, we stopped it in 2014 and it, a different company has bought the, the permits. That's a longer story, but so some of the work I've done over the years, um, it was with some Diné groups, um, indigenous groups. Um, and then later I got really involved with, um, anti-nuke groups, which were mostly Biladonna. So a lot of white, um, organizations in the East Coast and um, folks fighting uh, both nuclear weapons and nuclear energy work. Um, so I spent a long time working with non-native groups, building my own community knowledge about nuclear uh, everything. And so that's where I, that's how I did my work. A lot of it was just educating myself and then sharing that with everybody so i i i um i was on a call earlier today listening to a young Dinev woman talking about what it's like to organize on the res so having to um explain these really complicated concepts to our elders and then having to translate it so i personally um i i want to say i'm learning my language i'm really learning you know my culture and and things every day but um I'm not fluent, and so when I was working on the res back when we were fighting this uranium mine, um, a lot of the work I did uh, was to tell the elders what's going on and then having a translator explain it. And so over time, um, this reality of our people um, not using English first as, as a language, it's, you know, our people speak Diné our elders, they don't even, you know, read Diné, uh, Diné Pizad, because it isn't a written language. We had an oral history, our whole culture, everything was passed on orally. So how do we fight this big fight to stop a uranium mine or climate change um, when the reality is our people don't have access to internet, um, maybe even cell reception in some places. There's a lot of it, it, you know, out in the rural areas, um, that's the reality is our people don't have, um, some people don't have running water, much less um, high speed internet. So um, what I did and the way I did my work was, this is going back into 2011 to 2014. Um, I did a lot of driving, um, going to communities to give presentations and having paper handouts with um, a lot of information in a graphic way where people don't have to read so much, but um, kind of like an infographic, um, but but not so much reading. Uh, you can go to uh, my website that, this is this, this is a not a very updated website, but yeah, you can go to dinahnonukes.org and um, it'll show this page called the Radiation Monitoring Project and if you scroll down, there's a link for resources on educational materials. So, so what we did was a lot of education um, in, in a way that was uh, palpable for people. Um, so I, I live in the city and I'm not on the res. I, I don't live in a contaminated area, um, but I spent a lot of time learning about the issue. I lived, I moved back home for about a year and um, this is this is how I did my work was to immerse myself in the community. Even though I'm Dina, I I was still an outsider coming back home. So I had to understand my role as an outsider. So even though I am brown and my my clans are from there, my relatives are living there. That didn't mean I was easily accepted into the community. Um, a lot of people were interested in uranium issues because there's this thing called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act where they can get funding to, to pay for health bill, um, their health bills or, or, you know, if they lost someone from uranium mining. So this was like a little bit of money. Um, I mean, I'm saying a little bit, like I think it's like 150,000, but the RECA uh, money, it, it was supposed to sunset last year. And so this is a huge issue across the nation federally um, that we need RECA to continue. So when I was doing my work, people were more interested in their health problems, their water quality. So it was really hard to talk about 
uh, capitalism or um, you know, neo-colonialism, all this stuff that we're talking about today, you know, my elders, they were just asking me, what's going to happen to my body? I, I live in a place where I was breathing this stuff in. I live in a place where the water's contaminated. Our sheep were drinking the water. Am I going to get sick? And so that's what people were asking me. They didn't care what was going on at the COP. I don't even, didn't even know about the COP the United Nations convening of parties. I didn't, I learned about climate change, I think in 2005 is the first time I heard the term, but I'll just wrap up by saying the work I did was basically translating English, um, these nuclear terms, all of the complicated stuff into simple language, and then further translating them graphically um, into a paper product that people could easily take home and, and, and use to understand um, what was going to happen to their body. So that's what they wanted to know. So I helped to develop uh, this thing called a radiation monitoring project. That was to help to educate people on the, the issues they wanted to know about. Um, so that came out of the organizing to fight the uranium mine. So the things people really need on the ground are not necessarily the things we think are important. But somehow we have to figure out how to mix them or do both at the same time somehow to honor what the community needs are. And then at the same time, hopefully stop the uranium mine, <clears throat> stop the hydrogen hub or incinerator or, you know, whatever the community is fighting. Because what they're fighting is also cost causing all these other problems, uh, societal problems, economic health and and that's what they're really dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So going to Congress, going to these meetings, that's not a priority when their people are, their kids, their elders are coughing and sick and um, it's really heartbreaking. So, so that's why I do what I do is, you know, I'm kind of in the middle where I'm in the city and have access to some of the information and the resources and then take it back home and, and then engage in things like this or the legislature. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about my work, sorry I went on. I'll um, stop there, thank you. Yeah, thanks Leona. I mean, I know that you do so much, so thank you for that snippet. Um, just a reminder for folks to follow everybody here that's speaking and, and if they are tied to organizations to, to follow that, but also the individuals um, because folks like Leona are doing this on an individual basis. I think that's important. Um, Let's hear from Shaw, Julia, and then we'll bring Jonathan on. Um, I can relate to a lot of what Leona said about kind of not being in the space, but being in the space. Um, in my case, I don't know that they would consider me reconnecting. I was born and raised in Oregon to migrant parents, but my first language was their language. And that afforded me a really different experience with my upbringing because it was during the 80s into early 90s that my parents were involved and I'm a movement baby so my parents were involved in anti-nuclear work and um, demilitarization work the islands that my family is from Palau are part of the region known as Micronesia and that includes the Federated States of Micronesia um, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands as well as Nauru and Kiribati um, for the three countries Marshall Islands Palau and FSM those are known as freely associated states or they fall under the compact of free association which if anyone ever hears this free association is not free for anybody especially not for the people on the non-us side of it um so part of the work i do with pacifica uprising and just on my own um and it's kind of the root of a lot of the climate justice and bodily autonomy work is explaining our history and how we got to this point and explaining that the compact of free association those are three separate treaties that the United States has with us. And obviously we know the United States treaties, it doesn't go well for anybody. Ours happened within my lifetime. And so we um, regained sovereignty in 1994 and Independence Day is just us being in our dependence on the United States. Um, so that's where a lot of the work centers from. And then showing, because we are such a small country, Palau, right now I think has a population of roughly 20,000 or just under it as a whole country. And that's 
with I believe a third of the population being foreigners. And so for the kids in the diaspora who grew up in the diaspora like me, we don't learn anything about where we're from unless our parents teach us. And a lot of times because our parents are trying to assimilate, we don't learn things. And so the work I've been doing is trying to make our history and our culture more tangible and accessible and relating it to what's going on here because being part of the diaspora also means that we're settlers on indigenous land. And I talk about how in order for us to connect, in order for us to honor our ancestors and our heritage, we have to stand in solidarity with the indigenous people whose land we're on and trying to show the cultural relevance and importance there is an opportunity for a lot of kids who, I mean, nieces, nephews, cousins, who don't speak the language, who don't know even the basics of the culture, this is a, this is a starting place that makes sense. And so being able to show up, whether it's on line three or whether it was in DC, whether it was in Atlanta, and being part of those movements and showing that Pacifica people, especially in the diaspora, we have a space there. And it's, it's our responsibility to be in these spaces, to uphold and uplift and amplify the other indigenous people, the people whose land we're on. Because if my ancestors were alive, they would be like, yes, of course you have to do that. You're, I'm here. And so it's teaching and making culture relevant based on the spaces that we're in. And also teaching them our political history because not a lot of people have the time to sit down and read a 300 page document that basically explains why we're independent, but we don't get to make decisions, why our currency is US currency, why our post office is the US post office, why we're, we're independent, but rely on the United States for so many things. And at the same time, they continue to throw us under the bus. And so teaching those things, teaching that the United States military is not the only option to get off an island, teaching people that what the United States military does, what the Department of Defense does is devastating our natural resources, what it's doing to the land, and how it's now written into our treaties that we've lost so much ability to have that self-determination despite being told that we're sovereign. And so teaching them that history and showing how it's very parallel parallel to the history here and why these things connect and why we need to work together in forming that cohesive voice and like doing the work. Um, that's really kind of like the root of where this comes from and um, tying it in with bodily autonomy and showing people how like, and this was taught to me by one of my best friends that I can't believe I never thought of, but like everything spiritual is practical everything practical is spiritual. And so things that we take for granted, things we don't think about when it comes to um, like sustainability and to food sovereignty and to food security, how that fell apart for us at home because of colonization, because of where the military is now and what they're doing to us now. And tying that into we live in the United States now, this is how it's the same thing is impacting people and building relationships off of that so that we can work together because obviously more voices, more bodies is the last thing they want to see from us. And of course, we want to upset people in positions of power and authority. But that's a bulk of the work I do. And if I do a good enough job, I will work myself out of a job and the next generation will come in and take over for me and I can just drink tea and lay in bed and be like, look at them, they're so amazing. Cause I love Gen Z so much. They're so amazing. And that's my spiel, thank you. Thank you so much, Shaw. I think that was like super inspiring and I didn't realize you were from Palau, it's so amazing. Um, yeah, Julia, do you want to go next? And then Jonathan? Yeah, yeah. Just uh, want to appreciate everything that Shaw and Leona have shared um, in terms of, like, the why, why we get involved in this work or um, this continuation of historic Indigenous resistance and uprising is just, like, really inspiring um especially since uh 
sometimes I know that we feel like we're up against so much um, to be aligned in that way is really, um, is really awesome. Um, but yeah, so um, just real quickly, just some of the work that we've been involved in here in New Mexico or so-called New Mexico, um, our region is very resource rich in, in fact, so much that it's become um, a energy energy sacrifice zone. Um, a lot of the times we say like New Mexico is ground zero for a lot of um, continuing energy um, infrastructure, but also like new energy infrastructure. Um, some of us in our organizations have even said that uh, like we're the guinea pigs of, you know, emerging uh, technologies around um, energy development and energy storage and production. And so, um, we had really started our work um, in coalition with the Greater Chaco uh, Coalition that is um, ge geogra um, in terms of the geography, that's the um, northwestern corner of New Mexico or what they call like the Four Corners area or the San Juan Basin. And this is a highly, uh, a highly productive oil and gas um, extractive area and has been for some time now, I think since um, the uh, early 1900s, oil has been um, extracted from that region. But um, within that area also has a large uh, indigenous population, mostly Diné folks um, have been um, living and occupying in that region for some time now. But um, for Pueblo people, there's also a very important sacred site, like right in the middle of all of this uh, devastation, and that's Chaco Canyon. And so it's been a it's been a a movement where we are um, demanding the phase out of fossil fuels and the cleanup and remediation of those areas, um, but also the protection of cultural um, and historic landscapes that. Um, have many indigenous stakeholders involved, tribal nations, um, sovereign tribal nations who are oftentimes um, fighting for free prior informed consent and to be a part of full cultural landscape planning. Um, because while it's been under the federal jurisdiction, there's just been a lot of um, a lot of environmental and health impacts in the area. So, um, you know, moving into this uh, this conversation, this narrative around false solutions, we are now facing a lot of new energy infrastructure as, um, you know, a neoliberal agenda would like us to think that we're in the beginning stages of a just transition, but ultimately a lot of the times we are just continuing the fossil fuel era um, by way of, of carbon capture and sequestration or blue hydrogen or um, you know using those different types of energy technologies to uh, invest more, more dollars into just you know strengthening and continuing this like network of um, infrastructure that's meant to just extract. Um, and so a lot of our work now is just really trying to unpack like how how this even began in the first place, um, you know, tying its roots directly to uh, colonialism and systems of oppression and, um, you know, just the way that uh, colonialism trends over time. Um, we're seeing that in the midst of climate change, uh, our government is really focusing on protecting like small portions of biodiversity, but continuing to extract as, you know, business as usual, or using other types of market-based mechanisms to, um, you know, reach net zero pledges and offset carbon at different areas of the world. And so, really just um, seeing how um, insidious global capitalism it c continues to be, um, but also recognizing how 
um, indigenous resistance and uh, people of color mobilization and frontline uh, community analysis is really like what's uh, um, what's the, what's you know doing its part to dismantle those oppressive systems and so that's been a lot of the work that we've been doing at Public Action Alliance but of course none of that would be um, able to be like accomplished without being in coalition with other organizations like New Mexico No Fall Solutions like Yucca like Hoodwinked in the Hot House and then I even think uh, by way of other large coalitions like uh, People versus Fossil Fuels has also been a mechanism for us to um, continue to state our demands of keeping it in the ground, no false solutions, and a real just economic transition for, for all of us. So I'll go ahead and, and stop there and uh, let Jonathan uh, take over. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. It's awesome to spend this evening with some badass matriarchs from communities you know, across across the world. Um, so yeah, uh, again, my name is Jonathan Juarez Alonso. I'm from the Pueblos of Laguna and Nisleta, uh, both of which are just outside of so-called Albuquerque here in Tiwa territories. Um, I really got involved in the work through journalism. Uh, it was actually the first place that I got involved um, and it's still kind of like a side passion of mine. Um, but I was at Generation Justice, which is a project of KUNM, our, our local uh, public radio station, um, and was basically kind of just a correspondent going out to different community events and protests um, and covering, you know, kind of covering the movement from the outside. Um, and a lot of what we focused on there was, you know, narrative shifting and making sure that we're, you know, telling our stories from our perspective and the perspectives that we want to actually, you know, be uplifting rather than, you know, what opposition or what, you know, the white mainstream is constantly wanting to say about us. We want to make sure they're, you know, we're kind of disrupting that flow and putting out the media that our communities want to see as well. Um, so, you know, I joined Generation Justice. I was like 13. Um, I, I can't do math at the moment. Uh, but then uh, in 2016, uh, that's when I actually went to Standing Rock um, as like a journalist. Um, and was able to do interviews with uh, water protectors who uh, had been arrested and, and other, you know, indigenous frontline folks that were holding that ground there. Um, but that was really, I would say, where my shift was from, you know, being behind the camera and kind of covering these stories to then, okay, well, now I want to actually like kind of be in front of the camera. I want to be involved in actually like doing the work. Um, and so I came back uh, home to Tiwa Territories uh, really kind of just like charged up. This is also, you know, the year of the 2016 election, uh, which, you know, polarized and just kind of brought so much, uh, just so much into like the political spotlight. Um, so, you know, that kind of that mindset drove me uh, into getting involved with, you know, almost every organization um, here in Albuquerque. I think a lot of young activists kind of have that stage where they're like, in like almost like a little bit of everything and it's a little hectic uh, but then you kind of find your place and you settle down and you figure out exactly what you want to be doing um, so for me um, i was doing you know youth-led organizing from the beginning um, i was really noticing that in these spaces um, you know there's a lot of ageism towards young people that you know we don't want to you know take take young people seriously we don't want to give them a space at the table um, you know we've even heard of some of our elected officials say, you know, they can't vote. So, you know, they basically don't matter to them. Um, and so, you know, all these other things, but uh, going, you know, with that mindset then driving me to kind of create my own organization spaces. Um, and I was doing that from like 2019 to 2021. Um, and then, like I said, in 2021, I was uh, brought on for, you know, staff for Yucca. Um, but in 2019, Yucca actually formed um, kind of as our community's response to the climate crisis and to you know calls coming from across the world uh, that we need to be taking you know these emission reduction standards and you know keeping fossil fuels fracking moratoriums just these bold pieces of action that we need to be taking them extremely seriously especially in states like new mexico where we're one of the largest contributors to global emission global emissions um so it was actually you know uh, primarily indigenous uh, two-spirit queer young people from northern New Mexico that actually spent um, a week long, uh, like in a week long strategic planning 
uh, training uh, we have we hosted every year now. It's called our um, El Puente Summer Leadership Academy. It's actually been hosted every year by our parent organization, EarthCare. Um, but Yucca was formed in 2019 out of that um, leadership academy and has really you know, gone on to continue the call for those original demands of keeping fossil fuels in the ground and you know, a rapid transition to a renewable, uh, renewable economy. Um, and you know, kind of back to the question, um, how we do this is you know, really through a diversity of tactics for us. So, and I think that's you know, something that Yucca does a really beautiful job of exemplifying. Um, we have you know, some more theatrical actions where we staged actual mock guillotines outside our state capital where the blades, the ropes that were holding the blades were um, frozen in ice to kind of, you know, um, symbolize the time and, you know, the time factor and how inaction today will directly lead to, uh, you know, deadly consequences to young people, primarily indigenous young people in the future. Um, we've also, you know, we've had uh, civil disobedience actions where um, when we delivered our demands, we delivered them um, in, I believe it was September, it was a week after the climate strike, so it was like September 30th of 2019, and we gave Governor Lou Grisham a 30-day deadline to take action uh, before, you know, we would return. Um, and so, you know, put, put things into context uh, in our demands, there's a lot of different courses of action that could have, be, could have been taken. Um, the easiest of which would have just, you know, been to declare a climate emergency. Um, in the state of New Mexico, which is essentially, you know, the stroke of a pen. Um, and, you know, that 30 day deadline came up and we still hadn't seen any action come out of the governor's office. So we actually um, hosted a civil disobedience action where 21 of our members, uh, adult allies of our organization were actually arrested in the governor's office um, just for their charges to then just be, then be dismissed in court by the judge. Um, so, you know, civil disobedience, protesting, direct action. Um, we also, uh, as I mentioned, I'm the policy lead, so we also definitely uh, play uh, this like, political game that is very frustrating. And as I mentioned, you know, we don't necessarily see policy or this political cycle system um, to, you know, be the end all be all or to be the mechanism that's gonna bring out, you know, the liberation of our communities, um, but also recognizing that we have to participate in a harm reduction, uh, in a harm reduction stance, and and uh, from that space where we're, you know, recognizing that while you know these systems were never made for us, they're never going to benefit us. If we don't show up to participate, then opposition, the people that don't have our interests in mind at all, will kind of have full reign of the conversation. Um, so, you know, with that, we've been showing up to all of the different um, committee hearings for different pieces of legislation that we've been supporting. Uh, things like local choice energy and the uranium, uh, the prohibition of uranium storage or uh, nuclear waste storage here in New Mexico, uh, something that I think we're going to talk about tonight as well. Um, but also, you know, bills that we oppose, like the Advanced Energy Technology Act, um, other bills that we definitely see as false solutions because, you know, they include these technologies like carbon capture and sequestration, like offsets, like net zero pledges, um, all of which we've seen across the world are just being used to prolong the fossil fuels life here in New Mexico and, and across the global south. Um, so, you know, I think for me, what really drives um, the passion for the work um, is, you know, remembering, and I think, I think all of us obviously relate to this, um, but just remembering where we come from, um, the, you know, the lines of resistance that all of us have been born into. I was also born into a movement family, um, but also, you know, as a Pueblo person, um, really honoring and trying to, you know, just honor and live out the legacy, being a descendant of Pueblo, Revenu Pueblo revolutionaries, sorry. Um, just, you know, recognizing that in 1680, there was, you know, a massive uh, rebellion against the Spanish con uh, conquistadors here in New Mexico. And it was a unification of several tribes that didn't even speak the same languages. Um, but to see, you know, to remember that history and know that, you know, that was our community's response to at the time, you know, we had seen the Spanish as completely disrupting our way of life that had been in balance with our natural world for since time immemorial. Um, and particularly their taxes that um, because of the droughts that we have here in New Mexico, the Spanish were unprepared 
we were. They began taxing food at a rate that we could no longer afford. Um, and so that really, you know, kind of pushed things over the edge. But to see, you know, that type of resistance in response to that disruption of, our, of you know, our way of life. And then to think, you know, I think, uh, I think about this all the time. Um, but if my ancestors, you know, could, could see today, and I know that they can, but physically, if, you know, if they could be here and see the Rio Grande running dry year after year, or if they could walk into the Grand Kiva at Chaco, um, and see the fracking wells and see the ways in which industry and, um, you know, colonialism have continued to prey on what we have always deemed to be sacred and protected and, and sacred uh, as sacred. Um, and I wonder, you know, what their response would be, knowing that in the past their response was actually the only successful um, rebellion against the U.S. Con uh, US empire um, in Northern America, um, but also, you know, something that we to this day can see we're one of the only tribes that are still where uh, where um, we were found upon first contact. Um, and as a result, we still remain, we still uh, maintain so much of, you know, our languages and our ceremonies that have existed since time immemorial um, as a direct result of that rebellion. Um, and so, you know, carrying on that legacy um, and that passion uh, in this fight. Um, and yeah, I, as you know, also a quick note, um, this is, not a first, you know, this is like second generation for us. Um, I, uh, being from the Pueblo of Laguna, we had the largest uh, uranium mine, Jack Pyle uranium mine. It was the largest open air uranium mine in the world. Uh, to this day, it's an EPA super fun site. Um, but I actually, um, my family uh, was part of a lawsuit that made it to the Supreme Court that was ultimately dismissed uh, because they couldn't provide a legal deed to the land that we've occupied uh, for centuries. Um, but uh, then, you know, kind of as a result, and my grandfather growing up in, um, you know, in that environment of, you know, resisting pollution and, you know, colonization of our lands, um, he, you know, would ultimately move and relocate his family to Albuquerque. Um, and so recognizing that that environmental racism, you know, directly did push my family off of our homelands. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, that's what led me to this fight. That's a little spiel on Yucca and our diversity of tactics that we deploy to pursue this, um, these demands that we're pushing for. Um, but yeah, I'm going to hop off and uh, let Julia get back on. Thanks, Jonathan. I mean, I think everybody had so much to share and offer. And I just, you know, appreciate you all for, you know, spending this evening having this event um, on Instagram. Um, I really want to just also just shout out Hoodwinked for allowing us to have this space because really what we're doing not only is just conversing, you know, we're sharing tactics, we're sharing information. And I think that's really what the collective is all about, um, is about sharing our stories and learning the different ways in which we can continue to build a resistance that is grassroots, that is youth led and indigenous and BIPOC centered. Um, I wanted to see if uh, the audience had questions to comment, um, you know, and then, you know, the speakers too, if there was any quick reflections as we wait for um, some of the questions to come in from the audience. Um, yeah, any reflections that folks had hearing each other? I think for, for me, it's like hearing everyone's like stories or ways in which they connect with this type of work. It's just a reminder that on a global scale, a lot of these uh, stories of displacement or, um, you know, entering into these advocacy types of lifestyles are very similar. Um, all over the world and so um knowing that um knowing the different ways in which colonialism has impacted our communities um still to this day is just a really important um analysis that i think a lot of us have been really trying to center um because a lot of the times you know, frontline communities, indigenous youth, um, environmental justice communities don't always have a seat at the table 
and are often being spoken over or undermined um, in terms of how we're going to address these issues in the future. And I just want to point out that a lot of the false solutions work is decentering, you know, this more like uh, European or white settler analysis and making sure that indigenous peoples are leading this fight, that frontline folks are also included in um, any sort of future planning um, that has to do with um, uh, resource extraction or you just whatever, whatever it is. Um, it's it's been named not just like in the grassroots organizing movement but even through the recent um ipcc reports it clearly states that there needs to be diverse stakeholder engagement and also the utilization of indigenous knowledge and worldview to also um, address climate crisis um, and so just want to acknowledge that um, you know, there's folks like here, indigenous folks here that are, um, have dedicated their lives to this work and are still like <laughs> trying to center um, their and their people's analysis. It's just um, a really important um, aspect of this work that I think is just a huge system change for many, but um, I just, yeah. Again, just wanted to acknowledge that um, after listening to everybody's uh, sort of origin stories for getting involved in this work. Sha, are you gonna um, comment? I wasn't sure, like right before Julia spoke, if you were gonna. I say actually had a question for my fellow speakers, and that's for youth who are interested in getting involved but and i think it's fairly accurate to say that advocacy activism and any sort of social justice work when you're doing it within cultures that are very connected to like their heritage their traditions something that we come across a lot is having our opposition be some of our elders and have you come across that and how do you speak to Indigenous youth who are interested, but they've had maybe not the best experiences in bringing these things up to whether it's elders in their family, their community, or elders who are just very, like, interested in, like, not seeing change? Yeah, I know that Jonathan, you know, had brought up the Pueblo Revolt um, as like a really important part of our history. And um, I think a lot of like young people, like Pueblo people that have been wanting to get more involved in this work, acknowledge that history and want to make sure that it remains relevant in our fight against um, extractivism. Um, I feel like that is like an important um, way for us to to move about spaces where our elders aren't always in line or always agree with like direct action or with um, being unapologetically uh, in opposition of capitalism or you know whatever it is. Um, I think like the like young people have been really embracing um, our history of resistance. And um, it gives me a lot of, it gives me a lot of, I guess, solace knowing that um, that way of thinking is changing, you know? And I do feel like, even though like there may be moments where elders do push back on the way in which we're approaching the climate crisis there are definitely those that support um, young people in this work and 
by uplifting these concept of these concepts of it, making intergenerational spaces also lends opportunity for elders to learn from the youth as like the youth are supposed to learn from our elders like there's this reciprocity that happens when you're building those very intentional intergenerational or multi-generational organizing spaces i find that as a really effective tool for trying to continue to teach our people like why it's so important for us to uh, take really strong and bold stances um, to to address climate and to um, engage with climate mitigation strategies but um, we have to always like remember our history um, keep it relevant and I think that, that um, you know now in this new tech age we have a lot more accessibility to resources and tools and I think that's also um, giving us more opportunities to connect with who our ancestors were and what they fought for and why they fought for it. So, but I would also maybe um, I'll jump off and let Jonathan jump back on too, if he wants to speak to any of the youth work that he's been doing with Yaka. <clears throat> okay, just to respond, I guess, um, um, can, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Not a problem. Um, in our community, we often have youth who may be interested, they show some interest, and then they come up with their own elders, whether it's traditional leaders, community leaders, politicians, people that we're supposed to look up to who do not have our future in mind as they make their decisions. And that can be really disheartening and really just take away all of the wind in your sails when you want to do this work. And so I was wondering, have you come up against that within your own communities and how have you dealt with it? Um, so thank, thanks for repeating that. I, I, I guess just to um, jump in before Jonathan responds, I think um, I'm, I'm a little bit in the middle as a I'm not a youth anymore and I and I don't feel like an elder. Um, I'm kind of I feel like uh, needing to bridge the gap sometimes. Um, for me, as a Diné person, I this is my personal perspective. I don't know if other Diné people I don't speak for everybody. Obviously, none of us do. But um, I kind of break it down into like three different um, major audiences. I, I don't know if that's the right word. Because on Navajo Nation, we have our government, um, which they're the elected officials, whether people vote or not. I mean, that's also a colonial construct. Um, so there's the government that was put in place specifically to sign fossil fuel leases back in the early 20th century. And then we have the um, traditional elders, so like medicine people, um, knowledge holders, um, so folks that are still doing and practicing our old traditional ways, like Jonathan was mentioning, and then, um, and then, and then I, and then this other group we might call I, I call the grassroots. So that would be us activists who kind of bridge the gap between tradition and then advocating in the political world, um, and oftentimes we're fighting the Navajo Nation. So like right now, the Navajo Nation government, um, they want to develop hydrogen and helium and whatever they can because of economic development. The good thing is the, Nav the Navajo Nation has a law against uranium mining. So that always helps my work. And that's because uranium mining, has, uranium mining has killed a lot of my people. Um, and we're still dealing with all of the radioactive waste. So it's easy for me to fight uranium issues on Navajo because of the law, but there's a lot of complications because of c colonization. Um, in the northwestern part of the state, that's called the checkerboard area. So the laws are, it's extremely complex because whoever regulates depends on which jurisdiction you're on. And sometimes that's different on the surface and then below the surface. So like water rights or mineral rights might not be the same might not be owned by the owned, uh, you know, um, 
I, and that's the other thing is ownership, the Navajo Nation. Hi, everyone. So we just got um, our, kicked off our live. So sorry for the folks who are watching. Um, I don't think anyone's tuned in yet. So, okay, we got some folks tuning in. I'm going to try to re-add our speakers. Hello, friends who are joining. Um, Alejandria, who is hosting, is taking a little break, but she might hop back on in a bit, and some folks had to go, but I want to give our speakers time to finish up. Um, so if our speakers are able to request to join, that would be great since... I'm not sure how to add you, but I will try to figure that out right now. Um, okay, so our speakers need to join before I can add them. <laughs> so thanks folks for just watching me be here until we get our speakers back on. <laughs> okay. Shaw, I'm trying to accept you. Hello. <laughs> We're back. We're back. Better than ever. Okay, you could join. So. And. All right. Let's see if we can add Jonathan. We can on there we can have some really great events happening this week for the 10 people watching <laughs> if you're in new york city you could go in person and there's another one online um alejandra if you want to join from your personal account feel free if not it, we can wait and see we can wait a little um Jonathan, if that's you as Yuka, feel free to request to join. I'm trying to add you, but it's not working. Hi, Julio and others. Um, Shaw, in the meantime, oh, someone else. There's Alejandra. Is there anything you wanted to share um, when we got cut off by Instagram. Hello again. <laughs> um, I was enjoying everyone's answers. Um, for us, we definitely come up against opposition within the community from political leaders, business leaders, even traditional leaders, and it's rough because these are the people that you want to believe have your best interest as a community in mind in their decision making and they often seem to be in our case um, the first ones ready to sell us out whether it's for cryptocurrency um, or whatever other false solution they claim is going to save our islands which are just working to get us underwater faster. Yeah, I mean, if I can just add really quick, you know, uh, I don't know, Jonathan, if you wanted to add, but, you know, I feel like during our legislative session, we are kind of always undermined um, our analysis specifically, like on things like hydrogen or whatever. And it's really um, disheartening because it's like, you know, there's always a call for engagement of younger organizers. And when it actually happens, they write us off. And that could be politicians or other organizations. And really, it's an elitism that's like based on white supremacy. And it's just, it's awful. And I feel like, 
you know, um, I don't know if they're still on there. I saw them on previously, but it's been good to be in, in community with folks who were um, in Los Jardines Institute uh, because both Sofia Martinez and Richard Moore were there for like the first people color summits. And they were there when, you know, they were young people trying to build a lot of these spaces that now have unfortunately been co-opted by political elite. And I think that right now is the time for us to, regain that power back um but jonathan i'll let you speak to yeah totally um yeah i was thinking about your question that you asked just before i don't know what happened that was really weird um but i think you know uh for me i remember especially here and i know it varies by family and, and community obviously but i'm uh i'm the, in my family the only i'm only the second generation out of u.s boarding schools um, and so to remember that like our elders today very much for survival learned assimilation and and were successfully colonized. And so we're dealing, unfortunately, with our communities, whether that's, you know, our spiritual leaders or, or just elders in our communities or, or our governors or presidents, um, you know, dealing with, unfortunately, colonized people that, that think it's, you know, that have this mindset that it is okay to, you know, sacrifice our resources or our cultural heritage um in the name of profit or extraction or, or whatever that is um but also you know that's really frustrating um obviously but also remembering i think you know kind of like julia was saying before she had to hop off but honoring and remembering our ancestors as well um all of us you know come from like i said earlier you know very resilient lines that obviously fought to still be here um and so remembering you know those ancestors ancestors as well and and that they were you know what they had to endure and push back against and that we're just continuing that fight um and also you know for young people in particular i think it's really unique um because you know we look at just about every social movement throughout history um and it's our young people who are front and center uh right now you know we see uh you know kind of hand in hand with uh, calls for you know uh action on climate from young people across the country we're also seeing um, massive, you know, uprisings for gun violence and gun legislation, um, but also, you know, going back into history of things like the Chicano uprisings and, you know, even uh, the civil rights movement that all of these, you know, spaces and movements were started by the young people. Um, and, and even recently in Standing Rock uh, started, you know, by our, um, our young people running all the way from North Dakota to DC. Um, and so remembering as young people that that's kind of, you know, the, the place in history that we hold that we're, we've always continued to push back against, you know, these systems that um, have imposed whatever, you know, whether it's uh, reproductive rights or, or whatever, you know, sovereignty rights, whatever it is um, that, you know, whatever they try uh, and force upon us that we've always been there to push back. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's what I would say in terms of at least, you know, kind of dealing with uh, those colonized mindsets, unfortunately, I've definitely dealt with that um, from elders and community. Um, <clears throat> but I also, and it's important for me to know, I've also, you know, had elders come up to me crying because of the fact that they have to deal, you know, with those mindsets at home that, that these people that, that they trust and that they, you know, that they want to trust and that they want to believe in, like you said, believe that they have their best interests at hand unfortunately are falling into these false hydrogen schemes, even though we're there, you know, even though that we're there to say, you know, no, this is a continuation of this trade-off capitalist system that indigenous people have always been, you know, a bargaining chip in. Um, we, we've had to, you know, I think it's, it's just important to remember, you know, we have both sides and it's, it's definitely really messy when, you know, in some of these communities too, when we get in, you know, we get into the money of it, um, I, like I, I know, especially, yeah, exactly, especially, um, I think all of us know, uh, we get into, you know, what the money supposedly can bring. Um, but I also know, you know, here in New Mexico, we've had elders, you know, found murdered uh, with all that money uh, just gone. And so it's it's been, you know, in all different kinds of ways, it's just been violent uh, upon, you know, just violence upon our communities. Um, and, you know, I think about you know, we, we have uh, fracking reality, realities tours um, here in New Mexico uh, that if any of you all ever come out, we'd love to, um, you know, facilitate and, and get you guys if that's something you would want to participate in. Um, but to see, you know, what these communities are enduring on the front line of the extraction um, is heartbreaking. And it's, you know, it's important to see and recognize that 
in you know, there's a community here in New Mexico and in, in Counselor, New Mexico, over a billion dollars has been extracted in in uh, resources from this community. And and then you go and you see the community and you know, you ask yourself that question, has has this community really benefited from you know, over a billion dollars being extracted, like industry likes to say and taunt all the time, you know, that's that's what they're doing for our state. And then you go see for yourself, like, is it really? And it's it's not. You know, we still have communities here that don't have electricity, that don't have running water, that, you know, are fighting for these basic necessities and, and rights to be met every single day still in the year 2023. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, that's that's what I would add on to your question. Thank you so much. Those were amazing answers, by the way. I really appreciate it. And I'm excited that people got to tune in and hear that. Yeah, sorry, just to finish my uh, previous thought. And I'm so sorry, Jonathan, I don't think my mute was on. Um, I made it made it snow. So so to just to wrap up, we have the government, the colonial structure, we have our traditional elders, and then we have a lot of um, just the community folks. Um, some people engage in the political mayhem, some don't. Um, so for Navajo Nation specifically, we are constantly at odds with the government, with the colonial government. And the people who, I, I the work that I do, and I'm sure this goes in line, I, I, I I don't want to speak for Jonathan and Julia, but I think um, all of us as indigenous people coming from, you know, some teachings and, and things that our, our elders and our ancestors have maintained for generations. Um, I think for me, that's what the work is about. So it's unfortunate that there's uranium um, at sacred places. Um, so this is one of the big issues is protection of sacred sites. Um, people argue, well, all of Mother Earth is sacred. Um, so we have a lot of our traditional ways intact that our elders, the traditional leaders, um, you know, advocate to protect, while at the same time, the government is, the Navajo Nation government is pushing for the fracking Jonathan was mentioning. So when Jonathan's talking about Chaco Canyon, my government wants to lessen the protections that were put on uh, around Chaco because those are thousand year old petroglyphs um, that the entire architecture, everything, it, it needs to be protected and maintained. But because our colonial government is charged or thinks they have to work toward economic development. That's that's where things got messed up with co colonization, I believe, capitalism and all these other so-called priorities have really impacted our traditional ways because we're no longer dependent on, you know, rainwater, it, especially with all the PFAS now. So, so all of these things, it's up to us to educate our elders. And it's the hardest thing I mean I don't know if you've ever been to Congress or lobbied in, in your state capital or even in your city council to me it's the hardest thing to lobby our elders in the Navajo Nation government because those are the people I mean it's easy for me to yell at a non-native person and in, in the colonial government it's easy for me to protest in Santa Fe um, and that kind of thing but to go home and then have to convince your own people that no, this is not the right, this is not a good idea. Um, so for Navajo Nation, again, I'm in the city, so it's a little bit hard for me. Um, there's a lot of people on the res, on the Navajo Nation. There's a lot of NGOs and individual activists. There's a, I would say a very strong movement. And I think our movements, Jonathan mentioned the Pueblo Revolt. Um, our people, we've been fighting for a long time. And so I think it's just in our nature, but how we do it, it's incredibly nuanced because of colonization, because of the laws. And like with uranium mining, I'm dealing with nuclear stuff that's on the federal level, but the state of New Mexico is like super pro nuclear. And that's one of the things I just wanted to wrap up with is we're fighting on, on, on the Navajo Nation and New Mexico um, there's no mining right now, but 
there is mining in the United States. Um, when all of the stuff happened with Russia invading Ukraine, the United States lost their supply of uranium. So where do we get uranium? I'm not sure, but there's a company I'm working on. I'm wearing my Hall No t-shirt. We're fighting a uranium mine at the Grand Canyon. So there is a push for domestic uranium mining. Um, so this is something I'm fighting and uranium feeds both the nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, which again, going back to something Jonathan said about the United States being one of the biggest polluters, that's also the United States military. So we're fighting all of these different issues when it comes to uranium, but nuclear energy is not a solution to climate change. Nuclear energy is a false solution because you need fossil fuels to produce the energy, the, the, the fuel. So uranium doesn't just come out of the ground magically and you can't make uranium fuel from nuclear power. You, you need to transport that stuff and you need a lot of other energy to make nuclear energy. And then afterwards, the waste, what do we do with the waste? It's forever. So this is something I've been talking to my elders about and um, the Navajo Nation hasn't taken a stance against this nuclear waste dump that's being proposed in New Mexico. But this is one of the biggest fights I'm a part of right now is to stop a nuclear waste dump. It would be a national waste dump for waste from all the commercial nuclear power plants. So in the United States, there's nowhere to put nuclear waste. And this is one of the issues um, we're having to educate, not just our indigenous elders. Um, the Pueblos have done a great job in fighting the nuclear waste dump and coming out against it and talking about climate and energy issues. But it's a lot harder for Navajo Nation when they're pushing the fracking and other stuff. So I'll just stop there. It just takes a lot of work and it does take um, patience and then using our culture to convince our elders, this is, you know, this is not the way to make money. There's other ways for us to protect our people. And, and that's the hardest part though, is because of the money situation. Thanks. And especially the money situation being something that our communities were put in by the people that were fighting. And so it's, I mean, not gonna lie, there are days where it's just completely disheartening because you feel like you're fighting people on, like at every level, every time you turn around, it's a fight. And it's like, could I just have a day where I have like one win, even if it means I just made my bed? One, you know, I mean, I have, there's, we could keep this conversation going for a very long time. And I, I hope that we can have more Insta lives and, and, you know, keep the conversation happening between you all and have others join and um, have folks be able to like more directly ask you questions in this way. Cause it's nice to, um, you know, reach a different audience on Instagram and um, connect with different folks that maybe are not connecting to the hoodwinged webinars and zoom and, all that jazz. Um, one quick question, and I know we got to wrap up because I don't want to take up too much of everyone's time, but, you know, hearing you, what you were just talking about, Leona, and, you know, what everyone's been talking about, like, someone who's watching this, you know, I'm here um, in New York City right now. Um, what would you recommend that folks who are not in New Mexico or, you know, not in these lands, um, would you recommend like a certain way of getting involved, like some action item or, and, or would you recommend just, you know, starting local and tuning into like, you know, what's happening here locally? Cause there's something happening everywhere, right? That we can all be way more involved in our local politics and the local fights and um, connecting with, um, you know, I could go into millions of things happening right here in New York, but I won't uh, right now. <laughs> sure, I can jump in because I want to give the last word to either Shaw or Jonathan. So, so I think the anti-nuclear movement in the United States is an interesting um, place. And I, and I don't think anyone needs to join it, per se. Or to be honest, I don't think people need to join organizations. I mean, I think it's good to start your own organization if you have a group of people um, to do some work, but I, I do believe strongly in strategic planning to, to figure out what is the issue and then how to go about, fig, you know, figuring out what to do. Um, so um, in New York, 
there's Indian Point. So I'm fighting a company called Holtec. And I think one way that we can connect is to fight Holtec all over the world um, for people that want to fight nuclear stuff. And there's people in New York City um, already organized. But like I said, you don't have to join their group. There's ways you can talk to your own elected officials or just educate other people. Because right now, Holtec wants to dump a million or so many gallons of uh, radioactive water from the power plant they just bought, which is about 30 miles north of the city. So they want to put that radioactive water in the Hudson. And I don't think people in New York City want that. But the thing is, they don't know about it. So how do people fight something they don't know about? I, I mean, so that's one thing is just to talk about it. Um, and, and so Indian Point is a power plant north of New York City. Holtec owns power plants. They've been buying them all over the place. But you don't have to fight. Like I said, you don't have to fight nuclear. I think the easiest thing, and I do believe it's important to write letters to your elected officials, even just a, a quick email that says, hey, I was on this webinar and I learned about this nuclear thing. Especially if you have nuclear stuff in your state, you can focus on that one issue. But um, the nuclear waste dump I mentioned, it's going to have national transport. So there's national issues that affect everybody across the board. But I, I think you said it already, Laura, just start locally on your own concern. I know I was I met my first EJ training, I met a bunch of teenage uh, women uh, doing something because the nail salon was contaminating their their neighborhood. And I thought that was really interesting. And, and so it's kind of the same issue, but it's different things in our environments hurting us. And so I think I think it's just educating people and then taking whatever appropriate action, direct action, political action, spiritual, doing your prayers. That's really important, I think, for indigenous people is to have those um, protections in place. So that's where I'll leave it. Thanks. Thank you, Leona. Um, Shaw and Jonathan, would either of you like to share some some final thoughts it can be on that question or you know some final parting thoughts for our loyal followers who've been watching or folks who've tuned in more recently thanks to everyone sorry okay um, oh no go ahead I, I was gonna give you last word but yeah no go ahead sorry no i was i was trying to give you last word um, yeah, no, I was just gonna say, um, I would definitely agree, you know, get involved locally. Um, you know, we have indigenous people everywhere in this country and, and beyond that are fighting against, you know, these same institutions of militarization, of extractive industries, um, and just, you know, all of these things that are intertwined. Um, definitely, you know, there's, like Leona said, there are different paths that, you know, you need organizations to kind of help you find that and you know, navigate that political landscape there's tons that you can get involved in or you can you know definitely you know just stay as an individual and uh, participate in you know whatever ways your capacity allows i think that's something really beautiful about these movement spaces as well as that there's truly you know spaces for everyone um just whatever you know skill set that you have to offer there are different ways that you can uh contribute to any movement that you're called to um but yeah, I think uh, I see comments. Yeah, we uh, we have our No False Solutions Coalition here in New Mexico. Um, we're going to be continuing uh, to stand up against these uh, proposed hydrogen production legislation and, and hydrogen hubs. Um, I know that there is a like Southwest or a tri tri West uh, Mountain Coalition of I think it's like New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah. I'm not entirely sure, um, but there are where they're uh, trying to propose other hydrogen uh, hydrogen hubs and hydrogen and uh, legislation as well. Um, but yeah, just anywhere that you can get involved, I would definitely encourage, um, especially, you know, young people, young people of color. Um, yeah, and I will, yeah, there you go. Last word, no pressure. Um, <laughs> actually, um, so I, when I introduced myself, I had mentioned this, and this is, this is one of my major soapboxes. This is a hill I will die on. And that is things like solidarity, mutual aid. For a lot of people, these feel like really revolutionary things. But for some of us, these things are actually just part of the culture. And so I am constantly reminding people that solidarity is not theoretical. It is not abstract. It is literally building relationships and not transactional relationships, because that is 
how the colonizers got us. You cannot build solidarity on transactional relationships. Solidarity is rooted in, hey, I met Jonathan and Leona through this, this IG live. I'm really interested in what they do. I care about them and their movement. And in order to honor my ancestors, because I'm a settler here, I support them. Whatever I can do to amplify them, to uplift whatever they have going on right now, even that. So like, go follow everyone who you've seen here, follow who they follow, see what they're putting in their stories and resharing and reach out to people online. I, I make it a point, whether it's through Pacifica Uprising or through my personal account to be very accessible um, because I'm an introvert and I don't necessarily like going outside and being around people, but I'm a firm believer with 20 plus years experience in building digital community. Pacifica Uprising has a small board of directors. There are three of them, plus me as the ED. We have never met in person altogether. Um, we have members who have never met at all. But these are people that I've been building with for years because digital community is just as important as in-person community. And when you connect with people and you can see where your movement space is are related because everything is interconnected you can help each other whether you're in that space with them or not and even if it is just sharing their story you can be a vase that is nurturing that flower and someone else sees it and goes out and spreads that story and lets people know and even if that's all you can do don't ever listen to anyone who's calling you like a keyboard warrior like share stories make sure people hear about it grassroots over big time like mainstream media this is how things get done this is how we've always gotten things done if it weren't for my ancestors doing it i wouldn't be here today so like in the pacific we rely on coconut wireless different communities have their own setup do that share it with your friends and if you have questions reach out to those accounts like whether you're interested in abolition bodily autonomy climate justice all of this is interconnected so just reach out to someone ask if they know anyone in your area and connect and really have those relationships like build real relationships and that is the one thing the enemy the oppressor does not want to see us do so do it and that's my soapbox And now I want to play with these filters like Leona because these look fun. I'm trying to send hearts. <laughs> I think when you're a presenter, I don't think you can send hearts. So I don't I like that. Think going so. on. Well, thank, thank you so much, uh, Laura. I don't know if you're, you froze maybe, uh, but uh, I'm probably going to hop off here soon. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what happened. Laura froze on my end too, but Same. thank you all so much. I'm definitely, we'll definitely continue to be in touch and you know, like you just said, we'll definitely be in solidarity and I'll be supporting uh, both of you in all the ways that I can. Absolutely. Same from our end. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more about your work and I, I know we're already connected now, so we'll, we can. Y'all are basically my cousins now, so whatever you need, I'm here to uplift and amplify. Awesome. Love of it. All right. Well, I'm going to jump off. I don't know about Lori. You guys have a great evening. You too.